Today I have here with me Peter Knight and Sue Wallace, who are authors. For those who don't know them, they authored, uh, is it 13 books? Was that right? 13 books, yes, and Sue has co-authored two of them with me, three of them with me. Okay. So um, you guys are also dowsers, right? Um, shamanic explorers, ancient wisdom researchers, uh, and sacred site guides. Uh, anything else to add to the list, or...? That sums it up. I'm also a shiatsu therapist. Okay, very nice. <laughs> I like it. Okay, so um, I know these guys because, uh, well, yeah. I went to one of your wonderful um, events at, at Sacred Site, King Arthur's Cave. So, yeah. Um, so you guys take people to these uh, sacred places. Why? What's to be gained from going to to, to a sacred place? Why, why? Why would people? You know, why should I take my family on a trip to Avebury rather than Disneyland? What, what's, what's... <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to answer that? <laughs> so, I mean, to start with, we believe everywhere is sacred, really. I guess even Disneyland, you know, the whole earth is sacred, just to put that in from the start. Uh, but I think there's always been certain places on the earth which ancient people and indigenous cultures today regard as being a little bit special perhaps where they feel spirit is present, and perhaps where they've been relatively unspoiled compared to uh, Disneyland. Um, so, um, uh, and we have, we have found it personally to be a beneficial uh, for us to go there. Uh, in a mad world, they can offer solace and calm. And uh, you can also open up a two-way communication between the spirit of the place and um, you know your, yourself, which we have found to be very profound on many occasions. So, what makes a place sacred then? So, when when you talk about a, a place that uh, you know opens you up and allows you to connect more deeply, so so what you know a cave might be sacred, but a patch of motorway isn't. What 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 is it? That, what's the difference? What is it that imbues a place with sacredness? Good question. And that might be the topic of another book. <laughs> <laughs> But generally, we're, we're talking about some kind of energetic quality that has, um, in a place like a waterfall or a cave, or usually some, some nature rather than a motorway where the, the energies are being disturbed or they've, they've perhaps been totally disrupted because of all the earthworks and then the actual laying of a motorway, as well as... The, all the traffic that's thundering by at 100 miles an hour. So, yes, usually a place that would be tranquil would be the best. Well, are all undisturbed places equally sacred? I mean, we have these sites like Avery, for example. Well, I guess that's a kind of disturbed. It's not totally natural, right? They're, they're, they're... Well, well, I think the ancient prehistoric sites are built very much with nature and the energies in, in, in mind. Uh, you know the ancient site. The ancient people were weren't seeking to destroy nature. They they were, they built their sites to be in harmony with nature and even to accentuate the beneficial uh, earth energies, uh, like the pyramids uh, in Egypt and uh, other sacred sites. Stonehenge and Avebury were built to enhance the earth energies and to let the shamans and the people uh, access uh, the beneficial. Um, energies that the earth has to give and uh, generally for the benefit of agriculture as well a lot of sacred sites were built i think to um, enhance the energies that go across the land and um, so yes even the early sacred sites and uh, even in classical times the temples the greek temples the roman temples um, uh, were built very much uh, with the landscape in mind it, very often it's about the landscape setting uh, as much as anything else uh, places like Delphi and things like that, and uh, even Stonehenge uh, and Avery. It's very much about uh, putting your temple um, not on the landscape, but rather to be held within it. I think that's the difference. People uh, in ancient times were working in harmony with nature, and at least for the last, you know, 150 years, we certainly have not been. And of course, we're, uh, you know, we can see what's happening at the moment because of that. We haven't been. We haven't been treating the land as sacred for an awful long time, and uh, things are coming back to bite us because of that. When when we talk about a place that's sacred, though, um, so you're saying undisturbed sort of places, tranquil places. Uh, so when we're looking for a place that's sacred, how how do we identify it? What, what 
So you see one cave, it seems more sacred than another. How, what makes it sacred? How do, you, how, do you, how do you go and say, okay, this is a sacred place? Or are they all sacred? Are they equally sacred? Are some place more sacred than another? And how, you know, how, do we, how do we sort of identify what, what makes something really sacred? It's a personal thing as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's so, the way it feels, I think. So some places might feel different to you than they would to me. So it probably is um, a sense of vibration and, and how we would feel in harmony with a particular place as opposed to someone else who may feel uncomfortable there. So again, it's saying what, what makes a place sacred might depend on the, the point of the viewer. Makes sense. Mm. Well, you know, uh, in the UK we have many, many megaliths uh, like Avebury and Stonehenge and, and these kind of places. There's lots of them. You go to Dartmoor and there's stone circles all over the place. So obviously the people doing this, were, appear, apparently the people doing this were, were sort of in tune with sacred places and making places more sacred. Um, so when I when I go to these sort of places, I sit in somewhere like Avebury and and I sit in a state of wonder, just just trying to understand what the hell were they doing? The effort that goes into making something like that, just tremendous. I can't even imagine. Yeah, you know, today when we when we build a house or build a building, you know, we we do it quickly, do we do it cheaply, and we do it for a specific purpose, whether it's a swimming pool or a tennis court or a house or a shop or whatever. When, you know, the the effort justifies the use. But when you go to a sacred site, the tremendous effort that went into that, how, how's it justified by the use? What were they doing there? What why did they build it? What was your take on this? I, I, if only we knew. <laughs> if only we knew, but I, I think um, certainly in the first uh, few books that, that I wrote, I very much was trying to get to the heart of, of why they were built, you know, and for what purpose. And that seems to be the, the uh, purpose, you know, the, the, the aim of most researchers nowadays. But I think in the last few years, certainly the result of our last two books, we've not worried so much about um, what, what it was for rather than how was it experienced and how can we experience it today? You know, I mean, you can be an atheist and go in a church or a temple and feel something, you know? Um, and I think when we try to analyze things too much, we actually rob ourselves of the experience. We're all doing, doing, doing instead of being human beings, you know? And uh, what you do, you said just, you go to Abe and you sit down or lean against the stone. That's a very good start. Because I think sometimes we charge about um, and, and put lines across maps and all this sort of thing. And it robs us, uh, to me, of something which certainly, uh, to me personally, has become prime importance and that's experiencing what's there. And we have found, I think, uh, that when we turn the mind off um, and when we just try to sit and tune into a place, whether it's a, a temple, a stone circle or a waterfall, ironically you actually end up receiving more information and more insight of what the place is really about when, when we turn this thing off in, in our heads you know easier uh, said than done though of course it is of course it is what's um, the trick uh, focus on, on being in the now just being where you are and seeing what's around you just you know look at Blades of grass, flowers, clouds. And the more you do it, the more it becomes easier to just let your mind just wander and, and just soak it all in. And that includes not just visually, but what you sense, including feeling the love that comes from the earth. Well, so when we visit these places like Avebury, um, you're saying sort of connect in, turn off your mind, sort of just absorb what's there. Uh, two questions. W one, has anything come up that, uh, for you while you've been absorbing that, that gives you sort of a sense of why they built these things? And, and two, you were saying that it's not really so important why they built it and more what we do with it now. What, what do we do with it now? Um, what do we do with them now? Um, well, well, I think natural sites and um, you know, temples and Abri and stone sites like that. I, I think, I, I really believe, um, want us to go to them, connect to them. There is a spirit, there is a presence there that responds 
for you to you reaching out and I think that's a good that's a good start a good point to start from to realize that when you sit in a cave and when you sit in a stone circle even though you're alone you're actually not alone and you never are you can't be alone you know everything is energy you can't detach yourself from a living planet which is part of a living universe that's impossible but the more you tune in and we use drumming sometimes don't we and chanting to connect us with the place quite regularly and the more you do that I, I think the more the site responds to you I really do um, and that can work out that can work well if you're dowsing you know which can be a logical or an intuitive practice but uh, also when you're just looking to I, sometimes I'll just sit at a waterfall or in a cave and I'll, I'll say okay uh, please show me what I need to know you know and uh, and then you know if, if the site reads your heart uh, and and realizes your intent that I find a lot will be given you know mm -hmm. Albion Dreamtime is is full of us going across uh, the whole of Albi and the whole of Britain, isn't it? And just going to places and just asking that question, what do I need to know? And what kind of stuff is given? What kind of stuff comes up? Is it about your personal life or is it yeah, about the place? Um, <laughs> yeah, j just uh, both really, yes. Um, but yes, and sometimes how the site was used in the past and also how we can use the site uh, for the betterment of everybody and um, sometimes to an answer puzzles and sometimes... Um, Sometimes the, the river will speak to you. It, it sounds a bit uh, hippy trippy and that you know sort of thing. But you know, sometimes we'll just sit by a river or in a cave with pen in hand, and the stuff just pours out. You know, because you've tuned into the landscape. A good poet and a landscape artist will say, you know, they didn't do that. You know, they've made this connection with the land, and the poetry just flows through into them from somewhere else. And um, I, I can really appreciate that now. Because I've been through all the logical stuff. I, my first three or four books are about putting lines and ley lines across maps and plotting every single stone and why is that lined up. And uh, that's a very useful process because it, 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 more than anything else, it made me appreciate, you know, what geniuses our, <laughs> our ancestors were. Uh, you know, they knew all about the heavens and the movements of the planets and all that sort of thing. But that only seemed to take me so far. And then when Sue and I started working on projects more to do with the land, uh, it took me to a whole new level. Well, so y y your guys' work is not just with megaliths like a brain stone hand in these kind of places. You also work a lot with what, simulacra, sim sim I don't know how to mm. pronounce it. Um, so, yeah. so why are they worthy of attention? What makes a place, mm. you know, simulacra spot special versus just, I don't know, any old stone or river or whatever? I mean, well, in doing the Dartmoor book, Dartmoor Mindscapes, it really brought home to me uh, the importance of simulacra because uh, a guy called uh, Chris Tilly had done work with the simulacra uh, in Brittany and southwest England and Wales, and he said whenever he he, find, he found a prominent simulacra on a tour, you'd find it, it would be visible from a stone circle or a stone row, and very often the stone row would be lined up only with the tours that had the simulacra on them. And I started thinking about this and I found the same thing in Dartmoor. The stone rows line up with the tours, you know, they don't just march aimlessly into the distance uh, because the tours are where the ancestors lived. All around the world, uh, in Japan, you know, and, and all around the world, sac mountains are sacred, very often taboo. And, uh, and it was the same with the tours of Dartmoor, I found that, um, you know, and when you go up to those tours, they're the ones with a simulacra on them. You know, sometimes looking down at the stone row, looking down at the stone circle. So I thought, well, this this is a, this is surely evidence that uh, they're not putting a stone circle or a stone row willy nilly anywhere. They are focused on the places where they believe the ancestors reside or the gods reside, uh, which is the same now with holy mountains all across the world. And um, this was a real breakthrough for me. And um, it, it showed what it showed the, the shamanic mindset and an Aboriginal mindset, if you like. If you go to Australia, the Aborigines hardly build any sacred sites, but their sacred sites will be rocks that resemble something, or uh, trees that resemble an, an animal, the rainbow serpent. And it's like that all over the world with indigenous cultures. The Sami, the Lapland Sami, they they, they often gather at rocks that resemble something so this is a universal concept now i know that i think archaeologists are gradually coming down round to you know sometimes we have to wait for archaeologists to catch up you know but uh but, but yeah once you once you see these simulacra and where they're gazing you know you realize uh that you know especially in the case of 
granite. Um, you know, the, 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 a granite tour has only weather, weathered about one centimetre in 4,000 years. So therefore, the simulacra that's looking down at the stone row now that I'm standing by actually looked virtually the same back in the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer times. So this was a real breakthrough. We're not just looking, we're not, you know, we're not just imagining something that uh, they might have looked at something similar. We're actually looking at the same heads that people looked at 4,000 years ago. And that really that is an amazing is. thing. So for the uninitiated, what, what do these simulacra look like? What are they? They're, they're like snake heads and that kind of thing? I mean, is that, is that... Well, I can show you a couple. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a brilliant one there uh, at Vixen Tor. Uh, a mouth, eyes, there's one here, uh, two, two faces looking at each other, big rock outcrops, there's one there that I'm standing next to. Uh, they, are, they are all over Dartmoor, sometimes you can sit behind them, underneath them, and um, once you start looking they're absolutely everywhere. And uh, we've got some brilliant ones from all over Britain in our Albion Dreamtime book. We've just gone to places and we were, we're thinking, why is this sacred? And then blow me, there it is, a huge big green man, a simulacra that no one had photographed before. It's not like in plain sight, you know, but no, people have been looking at there rather than the head. And uh, we thought, well, we, we're, look, we're going to the original hunter-gatherer sites because mm. uh, our aim is to get people into a hunter-gatherer mindset again. So this is pre-Abri, pre-Stonehenge, pre-Stone Circles, because we, we have a thought, don't we, about the Neolithic, really. Uh, Graham might disagree with me, but uh, it's... Um, in many ways, the, the, the pyramids and the stone circles and Abri and, and um, you know, Stonehenge and all the, the Mayan temples and all that sort of thing, the, 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 a lot of people see the Neolithic and the Bronze Age as like the uh, culmination of man's civilization, you know. Um, but I actually see the Neolithic as when things started to go downhill. Uh, because people are building these temples, I believe, to connect with something that they've lost. In the hunter-gatherer days, uh, when we all had the sensitivity of a shaman, everybody had the sensitivity of what we call a shaman today. Um, you know, you had that close, personal, feral connection with the landscape. But of course, when farming arrives in the Neolithic, we lose that. As an individual, you know, working on the land in one place, you're not a hunter-gatherer anymore. So you've handed your power over to usually one shaman in the tribe. So individually, people have lost that. So we're looking, in Albion Dreamtime, we look back to the hunter-gatherer sites, didn't we? Which were the waterfalls, the caves, the tours, all the natural places. Because that's where I feel we have to reach back to, um, to help heal the earth again. So, so when, when we're talking about these, um, these simulacra, these saint, eight, eight, sacred sites all around, the, all around the place, people obviously built um, you know, uh, stone circles, n nearly simulacra, and they, they found them important and they, they, they all had this sensitivity and they really cared about this. Um, but you say we need to sort of reconnect with that knowledge, that wisdom, that way of living. Do, do we want, what, like, why do we need to care what people 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago thought? What, why, why is that important to us now and what do we do with their wisdom? If, you know, how do we readopt it and what, you know, what do we do with that? Wow. The state the world is in at the moment, with how much destruction that we've created, and we desperately need to reconnect with the earth and work in harmony with her to to try and rebuild the the, the networks of this interconnectedness, because so many of those connections have been broken. People are just living in their little boxes and going from A to B in little metal boxes and sitting at home and looking at screens. It's just mindless. There's no connection at all with what's going on in, in Earth itself. And she's not happy. So is that why she's causing forest fires, droughts, floods? We need to make that connection and find out how we can heal this situation. See, I think until, yeah. um, sorry, I think until relatively recently, um, in human terms, um, and certainly in Aboriginal cultures today, there was a time when people only took what they needed. If you're on hunter-gatherer, you only take what you need. So 
that's it in, in one sentence really. We should only be taking what we need uh, and not producing and, and, and uh, you know, producing an excess of everything, which is what we do, because that's what uh, commerce and, you know, uh, thing, money thing is all about, creating uh, to, to sell as much as you can. But uh, we now know that the earth can't sustain that. You know, the recent UN studies show that the, using any scenario, mankind cannot feed itself in just 50 years. If you go past 50 years, there isn't a scenario other than pulling all the rainforest down where we can feed the growing population. So clearly, um, you know, some, something's got to change. And um, we've got to get back to that stage where we only take what we need, which is the hunter-gatherer mindset. I'm not saying we all... You know, we, we, we all use cars, we all use houses. I'm not saying we all start, you know, going back to caves. Of course not. There are certain aspects of modern life which we embrace and which are nice and very positive. But um, it's the actual, it's the basic philosophy which is wrong. The actual accumulation. It, it was once said that hunter-gatherers share, but farmers acu store, accumulate, you know. Um, and uh, that's when it all started to go wrong, because when, when farming arrived, um, people are now um, more able to survive a bad winter, a drought, famine, wars. See, what nature does, if you have a bad winter, it kills all the sick animals off and it kills all the bugs and all that sort of thing. But medicine has got so far now that, um, you know, um, the weakest species in nature, <laughs> you know, um, the weakest uh, people in our society, you know, don't, uh, you know, won't naturally go back to the earth. I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying euthanasia or anything like that. I'm just saying what the difference is now between now and hunter-gatherer times. And uh, as soon as farming arrived, it changed all that. And uh, and also the one thing about farming arriving is that is that the land is now somebody's property. All the land is somebody's property. It's owned by somebody or some country, state or an individual. I mean, who said that? Who said that should be... You know, that's another thing, you know, if you've got something over there and I want it, I'll go and get it. So uh, that's not a hunter-gatherer thing, you know. Um, I haven't found one evidence of a, of a war or a battle in Mesolithic times, you know, and um, even in the Neolithic there are very few, um, but that's when it starts. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is, um, and I'll be totally honest now, I always say, um, you know, perhaps there isn't an answer. <laughs> Perhaps there isn't an answer, um, which adds lots of other questions about our future ability to uh, live on this planet. Um, so. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that occupies my mind all the time, and it's something I, I really base the way I live around, and, and it's very hard to deal with this, this question of, uh, well, apocalypse, basically, that's kind of what we're facing, right? That's what it looks like right now, massive climate breakdown and major upheaval and, and things not looking very good. And um, yeah, certainly certainly taking more than you need may be the, the foundation of it. There's a great Gandhi quote, he says, um, there's enough in the world for everybody's needs, but not enough for anybody's greed, right? Exactly. And um, yeah, you, you say maybe there is no answer. So in responding to this threat, uh, what, Maybe there's no grand answer for the whole planet or for everybody. What, what, what about personally? What, what, what's your take on how we, we, we deal with this? What, what do we do? Well, there's a lot we it's, can do personally, there are for a lot sure. Of we can yeah. Do. I mean, flying, we've, just, we've made a decision not to fly anymore not fly. and not to go to other countries unless we can get there by ferry or car, you know, because one of the biggest pollutants is aircraft. And that'll be one of the latest, that'll be one of the last things that they ever make electrical. They're still scratching their heads, you know, and that's one of the biggest polluters and also uh, freight and that sort of thing. We bring, you know, bananas from the other side of the world and all that sort of thing, you know. Uh, so much of what we buy is made in China and then shipped the other side of the world. And that's that's not sustainable, you know. Sustainability has got to be the watchword for everything we do. We can't just go taking, as Pete said, everything there's got to be something left there for the future. But is that enough to stave off the apocalypse or, or you know? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. Probably not. But I think uh, at least... We're overpopulated. When you said threat, you know, it's a good word, but the, the threat is from within, really. It's, it's a self... Sustain, it's a, we're, we're creating the threat ourselves. And uh, 
the, the, the threat that we might not make it through isn't a threat coming from Mother Earth, because um, we like to make this clear during our talks and field trips, that, um, that Mother Earth isn't seeking to punish us and, and is not punishing us. Um, but it's, uh, it's seeking to create balance again. That, that's Mother Earth's bottom line. That's nature's bottom line. Nature, if it had a job description, would be just to create balance. Because that's what nature did before we came along, and that's what it might do after we've gone. Um, and when there isn't balance uh, there, then, then um, nature, Mother Earth, if you like, will do whatever she has to do to create balance. I, I don't think she wants to eradicate us completely. She's, she devoted a lot of love and energy to us, and I think uh, we're still going to be part of her magical journey. But I've known as an environmentalist for, my environmentalist for many years, we're not fighting to save the planet. We never have been. We couldn't kill the planet if we tried, you know. Mother Earth's in it long term, long distance, millions of years. We're fighting to see whether we're going to be around. And um, I think we will. I think we will. Uh, I think we'll make it in some form or another. Yeah, we're human, us, human. Not, not everyone. We've survived ice ages and all that sort of thing, and we've survived, you know, most of Europe got wiped out in the last plague, you know. We've had major um, uh, periods where humans have... have uh, have nearly not made it, uh, um, and I think we're certainly clever enough to make to to take anything Mother Earth can throw at us. But I think it's 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 a numbers game. I'm afraid there's too many of us. <laughs> um, I'm not making a judgment there at all. I'm just saying what the main problem is. It's not plastic in the oceans. It's not uh, polluting the ozone layer uh, so much. It's uh, it's population growth because that fuels everything else, fuels all the other problems we have. And that's the thing that I don't see an answer to, <laughs> to be honest. Um, we've got too good at staying alive and uh, we've taken the decision out of Mother Earth's hands. Um, so, yeah, I don't even know if there is an answer. Well, I mean, as we approach this sort of ecological crisis, I think, I think why I, why I want to do this interview with you, for example, is I think that the knowledge and wisdom that the ancient people had, that way of life would have never led to, to this existential <laughs> crisis that we're facing now. And so I kind of like to see it more readopted into our culture. And that's why I admire the work that you guys do, because I think that's basically what you're trying to do, right? Um, is, is bring back ancient ways of being and ancient ways of thinking and, and their wisdom and their knowledge and their understanding and their reverence. Uh, back into back into our lives and, and, and I think it's the sacredness I think I think uh, I think from the moment anybody on our field trips or go or on our talk so you know from the moment somebody goes away and and or sits at the base of a tree or in a cave and uh, and once they once they regard the earth as sacred at that moment once they say god yeah the earth is sacred once you once you have that uh, epiphany then you can't possibly destroy the earth or do anything that would lead to that. So that's why we need to adopt that as a species, because once we regard the earth as sacred again, as a species, we, we won't let it be destroyed. We couldn't. We couldn't. That, that's, so that's why we're taking people out onto the land and getting them to regard it as sacred. That's the bottom line to all our, tr our trips now, mm. isn't it? Um, and then at an individual level, um, they've got it. And of course, you know, as Greenpeace say, act locally, you know, think globally. And uh, I think that's all we can do and hope the ripples ripple out because there's people doing the work we do all over the world and oh, yeah. been doing it for longer than ours. And the Native Americans have been holding the space, the Aborigines have been holding the space and lots of other people. And um, we, we just need more to get on board, I think. And uh, the, the, but the secret, you know, you, you can be a, a member of XR, you can be a member of Greenpeace and be an atheist. But the moment you cross that threshold, and you regard the earth as sacred, that's a game changer, I think. And we need to get humanity to be on, on board with that, if, the, if it's going to be a, a hope. Yeah, because at grassroots level, if you regard everything, every part of the land as sacred, you can't bear to see litter dropped anywhere. We you pick up a lot of litter. You, you, don't, <laughs> want, you don't want to use weed killers. No. And you don't want the local council using weed killers, so you, you start writing to them and <laughs> complaining. So it, it's all very, very grassroots level. 
Well, I think part of part of the, the, the healing that we that we have to do as a species um, involves reconnecting with this ancient way of looking at, at the world, which is one of, of reverence and one of uh, connection and one of, one of one of caring. I think, um, and and I think going to sacred places helps with that. You know, I was I was looking at the I went to the Uffington White Horse and I absolutely loved it and I found it really really special um, and it was beautiful and it was enchanting and I try to understand like when I went to Avebury it's like okay they made this for some magical sort of uh, uh, ritual purpose perhaps something like that sort of maybe but but when I see something like the the White Horses I got really no idea like what the hell are they doing what's your take on on, on these because they're all over the place and they're near they're near the the, the stone circles in many cases and just what, what, what's, the, what, what's that? Right? Most, most of them are fairly oh, modern the but the Offington is prehistoric and the Long Man of Wilmington is prehistoric and the, uh, so. the CERN giant is almost prehistoric but yeah it's often the landscape um, context again um, you know you, you go to the CERN giant and the CERN giant is, has been etched into a phallic shaped hill well there's a clue and opposite the, the phallic giant uh, is a big uh, hill sticking out the shape of a pregnant tummy, you know, so the druids who, who did the giant, uh, you know, have lined the astronomy and the stars, Orion, so important with the pyramids, uh, is what's dated the, um, the CERN giant, because Orion used to rise over the giant when it was etched. So there's all sorts of things why a place is there. And, but, but the one thing it tends to have in common is, is, is the landscape. But the white horse at Offington, uh, which is actually a dragon, Mm -hmm. It always was meant to be a dragon. It was Christianized by turning it into a horse. It's a dragon. There's a little bit of fire coming out of its mouth if you look at the picture. But it's just upslope from Dragon Hill. Now there's a clue. Dragon Hill is just below the horse. And uh, that's, that to me is the power center mm -hmm. we found. It's, it's a, a pregnant tummy of a hill. It's natural, possibly being flattened at the top, but that's where all these energy lines come together after flowing down the spine of the horse, which exactly mirrors the energies, what the energies are doing. So when we take people anywhere, we always say, you know, before we start looking at this stone circle or this stone row, look at the landscape. Why is it here and not over there? You know, why is the horse there and not a mile near a wantage, you know? And uh, you nearly always have an answer with the landscape context. Uh, and then you start thinking as the shamans did. And uh, nothing is ever isolated on the landscape. Uh, you know, no matter what it is, I will stand there and I can give me 10 minutes and I'll, I'll give you a fairly good idea as why it's here and not down the other end of the hill. It's all about seeing the bigger picture which is what the hunter-gatherers did thousands of years ago. Um, things aren't isolated on the landscape, they're connected to everything else. And once you start thinking like that, you can bring that mentality to today's environmental crisis. You know, you, take, you get rid of a species somewhere in the ocean or off one coast, it affects something the other side of the ocean. You know, and the, the plankton blooms are affected if the whales go and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I get that feeling when I look at the ancient cultures they too regarded themselves as part of a bigger whole. And with that mindset, you, you've got this sacredness again. The land is sacred and I'm part of it. So therefore I must be sacred, you know, which is a, which is a good space to be in. Well, you guys um, are uh, earth energy researchers. Part of, part of the work you do is with connecting with this, this kind of sacred energy that under, um, runs through the earth. And so part of that is with dowsing, right? Now, you douse ley lines. Um, is, is that it? What, what, what? No, what? <laughs> I, I have a very rudimentary understanding of dowsing. And I don't, it's, please elaborate. Are you, what are you dowsing? And what, what, what? We're dowsing energies. Are they ley lines? Ley lines are straight lines of points that are connected, but they're purely on a map. So... It, they very rarely have any kind of energy associated with them. They, they, are, they are literally three or more, more points of interest, like a church or a hill or a well, that can be, you can draw a straight line through them. They often go for miles and you got more more things connected to them but are they energy lines are they yeah, what you're down not energy we have found the energy lines to go around Usually, them like a caduceus yeah. that's what the caduceus is telling you and then where the where the male and female the yin and yang energies cross abri or you know 
somewhere else, Glastonbury, and uh, where the yin and yang is in balance. So we, we, we tend to regard these deusable energies as dragons or serpents. And if you look at all the ancient cultures, they've all got dragons and serpents. You find an ancient culture that doesn't deal with dragons and serpents. And uh, they're referring to uh, these flows of energy. The veins and arteries, you know, like the veins and arteries, every now and again they come to the surface in your wrist. Which might come very handy eventually one day. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. Um, and it's like that with planet Earth. Sometimes the serpents come to the surface, your sacred site's there. Sometimes two come to the surface, because the Earth is 3D, it's got a thickness. Everything's not, that's the trouble with map, da map dowsing and things, it makes everything look as if it's flat, but it isn't. You know, the Earth has got a skin just like us. So we, we, we find our dowsing, and when we teach dowsing, we say, right, we're going to douse for serpents now. We're not going to douse for some line that's going across the land like a line of pylons. You know, uh, how inorganic is that? Well, I, I, I you know, saw you, you guys have an affinity. There's a dragon right there. I was going to say, you guys have an affinity for dragons. Mm -hmm. And and I, I went to your your King Arthur's Cave uh, ceremony thing that we did, and, and I saw you got some dragon stuff. And, you know, I, I don't know whether King Arthur existed. He probably did. Who knows? But 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 dragons presumably never existed, right? So so you, you were talking in one of your talks about that was a sort of ancient dragon serpent cult that got incul incorporated into Christian features in churches and stuff around the UK. So um, what is that? Is that is that all just a reference to the energy lines in the earth? Or? I I think we shouldn't look at dragons uh, as being uh, not here anymore just because we can't see them. You know, um, you know, there's a lot of things we can't see, but they're there all the same. You know, what does the thought look like? What does love look like? You know, it is sometimes there are things that are beyond what we can see, but they're there all the same. And uh, I think the shamans of old uh, were connecting with these energies, these dragons and uh, these serpents, and that's what uh, eventually gets uh, brought into, um, you know, architecture you know, whatever they think a dragon looks like. There are some similarities all around the world, you know, and uh, serpents and dragons often, snakes and dragons often uh, morph one into another, don't they? And um, so, so I, I think I think uh, dragons are, are still here uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, you, it, it's hard to define what a dragon is. If you look at it as a bit of ancient mythology, then, um, okay, that's one way of looking at it, but I see them as still being here. Uh, the feng shui practitioners of, of uh, China would tell you the dragons are still here because they put their houses depending on where the dragon is flowing. So uh, you can use the dragon as a metaphor. Some people see them as actually used to be living and they're now, you know, been killed by St. George and St. Michael and all that stuff. But um, I, th I think the dragons ultimately is in all of us. It's the flow of Kundalini, you could say, is the serpent flow going up your body, you know. Because as above, so below. So what you've got in your body, you've got going across the land. Because we are part of the land. So, so you're 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 talking about dragons as being some sort of energy that's in the earth, or the mm -hmm. energy lines of the earth, perhaps that, that reside within the earth. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to, if you know, someone wants to connect with them, what, what do they do? Do they go and down? Do they get these sticks? Or what, what's the, how, how does one connect with a energy dragon or, or whatever it is? So, dowsing once you've learned it is really easy, and most people can learn to douse. So if you were to go to Avebrain with some of your L rods, these are brass rods, um, and discover these energies, you could quite happily just sit or lay down where you found them and ask for it to, to connect with you in some way. It will be interacting with you whether you like it or not. It may feel uncomfortable even. And then you would say, mm, no, I'm not staying here. And you, you might just move on. Um, so, yeah, the, the energies are there and they're willing to cooperate with us. You just have to ask. Yeah, I'm going to say ask permission, permission. to. We find yeah. we've had some stories of uh, <laughs> when we do an Albion Dreamtime of, um, of arriving at places and they, they didn't feel good or didn't feel as if we were allowed in. And um, that may have been spirit of place. Yeah. Um, Not always a dragon. No, no. But uh, it, it's all like with dowsing and going into a place, the similarity is you ask permission, you know, can I, can, am I allowed in here? Um, and if it says no, well, well, then we think, well, okay, what have we got to do? 
can we do anything to, for the site to let us in? Because the site might be keeping us out uh, for our benefit. It might be dangerous in there, you know. But um, the, the case of King Arthur's Cave was a good one that you, mm. you felt on one of our visits, didn't you, sir? We, we'd driven for two or three hours to get to King Arthur's Cave. Um, just for a visit, just for the two of us. And we arrived and I was approaching the cave and I always pause wherever we get to any, any of these special places and I say, is it okay for me to enter? And a little voice inside my head said, no. Oh, three hours? <laughs> just to say no. Hmm, okay. Uh, okay. Excuse the pigeons on the roof. <laughs> so I just paused for a moment again and I, I asked, spirit of place, is there anything I can do that would make it okay for us to enter into the cave? And the answer came back, sing me a song. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm no great singer and I never remember the words to songs. But I just stood there for a moment and did a little chant and the whole of the energy changed. And it was just wonderful. It just became um, a completely different place. And we were allowed in. Well, did that singing change me? Did it change the vibration of the place? Did it tune the vibrations to make it safe for us to go in? I don't know. But it made me think about a little word that you mentioned earlier. Enchanting. Chanting is magical because it can change things. I never made that connection before between in and chanting. Mm. We found that chanting and sound and gentle drumming played an increasingly yeah. large part in the Albion Dreamtime project when we went anywhere. And uh, sometimes we'd be given chants and uh, it was nearly always a different chant. Mm. And sometimes when we left there, what was that chant we just did? I haven't got a clue. You know, it was like, it was, it was the song of the place. Yeah. It was the song of the place and there only. And because uh, sound is a vibration, isn't it? You know, in the beginning was the word, you know, so everything vibrates, everything has a frequency. And I think uh, you, you, you'll have a job finding a religion or anywhere or a spirituality anywhere in the world, ancient or modern, that doesn't use sound or chanting or out loud prayers or songs or music, uh, it's so important to tuning somebody in. Uh, the OM, you know, you repeat OM and it can get you in that space. And uh, yeah, the value of sound cannot be underestimated. Mm. It certainly played a big part in our last couple of projects. Increasingly so. Well, you're telling the story about the King Arthur's Cave and, and you got the answer of, of no. Um, so, so you're also talking about when you when you're dowsing, for example, at Avebury, and then you lie down, and then you you sort of receive information, and you, you know you do the dowsing to do this. So that that sounds to me like sort of psychic work. Now, now, like, so to douse, does, do you need to be psychic? Can anybody douse? Like, and 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 getting this this yes no from the cave or whatever, or the information that's coming from the place, do you need to be psychic for that? Will it come to everywhere? How, how does that work? Anybody can douse. The people who find it the most difficult to douse don't believe they can douse. So all you've got to do is know that you can douse and you can learn. Easy. Anyone can do it. And it's not it's not a psychic thing. It's 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 a physical thing. Because the the, the rod that you might be holding, um, the message comes through you and you're your muscles in your arm will do a slight twitch. It's not a conscious twitch, it just it just happens and it will move the rods. Because the connection is Be because the you've is got the connection. You. Your your, your feet, feet are on the ground. Mm. Your head you're connected to the heavens and there is there is energy flowing through you. So it will happen. 
Mm. I but believe then, that it will happen. <laughs> so, so let's say you go in with this belief and you go and do this. Are you dowsing an objective, real thing, or is it a subjective thing? So, for example, when two people douse the same line, will they get the same hits, or will one person get it and one person not? Will it, will it be very? Will one person find it over there and one person find it here? Like, is it is it sort of objective in that way, or is it? It it may vary slightly because some people are more sensitive than others. So an, an energy line, particularly at Avery, they're often quite wide. So they may be anything from two or three feet up to 15 feet wide. Okay. Um, so somebody might feel the, the center of it, perhaps where it's most powerful, whereas somebody else might pick it up when it's right at the edges because they are sensitive to that change of energy. So... Yeah, but but generally you you've got if you had a whole group of people, and you're all walking in a line towards an energy line, and you're all dowsing, and you say to them, everybody stop once you've hit that energy line. Generally, once everyone stopped, it will pretty much be in a nice line. But we always say to people on our we do a dowsing workshop at Avery every September, and when we take them onto the Michael and Mary car and. And, and, and that happens there's a few there's quite a variation sometimes might be two or three feet and uh, I'll say right who's right and who's wrong and I'll say well actually you're all right you're all which is why science, scientists hate dowsing because you're all right because I said you're all different star signs you all got up feeling different this morning some of you are men some of you are women we're all unique so why would you think we'd all get the same dowsing result you know uh, people are different abilities with yoga you know some people get it some, some people can go you can lead into a meditation and some people will go really deep and the, and the person doing the same meditation might have nothing you know it's we're all different sensibilities uh, different abilities which can be changed and um, so yeah they're all correct I say because Mother Earth has got an individual relationship with you all you're all unique beings different star signs, you know, all that sort of thing. So why would you think you'd all get the same result? But no, dowsing can work for everybody. Um, if ever we have a problem with anybody, we usually find it's because they've been dragged along by their partner and they don't actually believe it. Because <laughs> of course, um, believing that it doesn't work is a belief. And, and your mind and, and things will be manifest by your beliefs. You know, so dowsing's a load of crap, so they don't get it. Because you're, you're telling, your, you're cancelling out what the universe is trying to give you. So thoughts are very important, as, as you know. And you have to come to everything with an open mind, which can be difficult at times with a, with a group, because everybody comes with pre-conditions, you know. But dowsing is also used from, on a more scientific basis in archaeology, hmm. because some people are in, um, recruited to dowse sites like on the, the television programs when they're doing the digs mm. and they will get people to dows across the field mm. so that they know roughly where to dig mm. and there's ancient roman walls underneath or burial burial um you know so yeah all sorts of things I, 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 and they're usually pretty accurate i went to rudy geller's house when i was young um, mm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we hung out with him for the afternoon. He was telling us he made his fortune from oil companies, mm -hmm. um, psychically discovering oil deposits under the ground somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's pretty, right. Pretty amazing. So um, anyway, generally if someone's going to douse, they would probably go and douse around a sacred site somewhere like Avebury, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's presumably because the energies are stronger at somewhere like Avebury than yeah. on the bridge and the motorway or whatever. So. Do you think that these these sites like Avebury were chosen because the energy was strong there, or do you think that the places like Avebury made the energy stronger? Oh, that's right? a great question, isn't chicken it? And the egg. It's always chicken <laughs> or the dragon egg. It always is. You know, it's um, well, quantum physics will say that both can be the case. Of course, you know that really does your head in, doesn't it? So um, yeah, I, th I think I, th I think the bottom line is the Earth energies were always there first. You know, the earth was here before as any people came along. So I generally feel that the earth energies are always there first. And uh, the temples, the stone circles and cathedrals and churches are positioned to access that energy. Uh, but certainly they can enhance it. 
you know, I'm sure they found that the Michael and Mary current met at Abury uh, and thought, right, this is great for our stone circle. And and they it probably had a, you know, a positive effect on the energies by ex accentuating it, you know. So uh, you can affect the energies by the design of your sacred site. Uh, as in with the pyramids, you know, it's really powerful at the top of a pyramid. And um, so, so yeah, uh, I, the earth energies, I think, always come first. But they always vary as well, you know, they, they vary all over the place. If there's no stones to pin it down, like some of the areas at Abury, the energy will wander all over the place. So the serpent is constantly moving. But when you put a stone in the ground, it's like a tent peg, you know, it'll it'll pin it down so you know every time you go there you're going to find it. So uh, you put a church or a temple on the site, uh, you put a temple on Delphi or anywhere else, you know, you'll know the energies are going to be there generally when you come back. Because uh, these serpents, they wander all over the place. They really do, because they're alive, they're organic. As, as a Shiatsu therapist, I liken these energy lines to the meridians. So it's the same meridians that an acupuncturist would use, but I'm just using pressure. But an acupuncturist puts his needles in those particular lines and in certain particular key points in the same way that that stone is being put into the ground at Avebury. So it's to, to stimulate it or to access it in some way that affects the health of our body. And is that also affecting the health of the earth in places where they've got megaliths? Well, this is the thing. So, so you're saying that, that maybe the stones sort of enhance a, a strong energy that's already there, right? So let's say you live somewhere, I mean, you, somebody lives somewhere and it's barren of dragons and barren of energy and it feels like a very unsacred sort of place. How can they, how can they make it more sacred, invite that serpentine, you know, good energy uh, to, or, or what's the trick to make a place more sacred? See, a feng shui specialist would probably say, bring water to the place, dig a pond. Um, sometimes you can actually put stones as we've done in our little stone circle in the garden. Yeah, I noticed that. It was looking very nice. And it can affect the Earth's energies to that place. The, the, the energy will move from half a mile over and it'll come and have a look at your little stone circle or your megalith. And you think, hmm, okay. You've turned your garden into a sacred space. <laughs> So that's a trick, make a little megalithic uh, stone yeah. circle in your back garden. I it like it. Work. Very, very nice. <laughs> I think as, as I think as as equally responsive if you want to make your place sacred, it's to build putting something in there, it's it's uh, equally important as your intent, I think. Mm. Your intent. So um Love. Do it for the right thing, lots of love, and then the, the positive energies will come there anyway, you know. You can be a loving atheist, can't you? You love your kids and everything like that, and you can have a lovely home with lovely energies throwing through it. It's all about the love and uh, the intent. Uh, there's uh, a lot of people often uh, do things with loving intent, uh, but um, there's also a lot of people all around the world that um, spirituality is used as a vehicle for their ego, I feel. I, I've seen that all over the place. I, I see it at conferences. I see it uh, in in a lot of, you know, supposedly turned on towns. So the ego can also get in by the back door, of course, you know. So uh, you've constantly got to watch, you know, the reason why you're doing things and what your motives are. And, um, yeah, and adjust accordingly. Because I think um, it's all about humility, I think, as well. I've taught more than anything. Because I think... Um, when you go to a sacred site, whether it's a waterfall or a cave or a stone circle, I think knowledge can be withheld as well as given. You know, the, the site will scan you in a few seconds and think, right, okay, um, what can I teach this guy? That'll be the, the, the most beneficial. Do I need to get him out of his ego, you know, or... Uh, trip him up. Trip him up. <laughs> so, yeah. so when you trip talk about a site like this, you give it a sense of personality. So, so your, your sense of it is that there's some sort of intelligence, a spirit there, some sort of... Um, some presence there that you can call it an intelligence or you could just look at it from I don't know, a quantum physics level you know if uh, if the site is on a certain vibration and you're not you're down here 
perhaps the site <laughs> doesn't want you in there, you know, doesn't want you in there. So it'll try and raise you up so you can, you know, you're more equitable to it. Um, yeah, we we see a lot of crap and rubbish left, left at sacred sites, you know, mm. and black candles and all sorts of stuff. So, um, again, people come to sacred sites, um, perhaps most of them in good intentions, but uh, they don't always realise what they're leaving behind. Sacred sites aren't a place just to dump all your crap, you know, uh, your emotional baggage. It's, that's that's not why. Why should it have your <laughs> emotional badges? Sort sort yourself out, you know, and uh, bring it love. And it's also important wherever you go, whether it's a stone circle or a, a natural site, uh, to be humble and also have a sense of gratitude, and also say please and thank you mm. uh, to go in there. You know, you, you wouldn't walk in a stranger's front door without knocking, you know. And uh, and it's the same with a sacred site. You know, there are presences there that have to be respected or as in some of my early days you'll scratch your hand you'll trip over you'll fall over you'll be tripped up you trip over a rock and you look around and there's no rock there you know and things like mm. that so you soon you soon get into uh the space for me of um of humility you know and it's not just about going into a church or a temple or a mosque or a synagogue a sacred site in a natural sense deserves the same respect in my opinion you were talking about not going there with your emotional baggage and, and going there with giving love. well we all go to places with emotional baggage but not, don't go there with the intent we've all got emotional baggage <laughs> oh yes oh yes but don't go with the intent of dumping it there you know uh, I'm going to go to this place to be healed really yeah and what's that where's that negative stuff going is it just disappearing is it just you know we have to be really careful um yeah, about what we leave at places because some the next person coming along could pick up on that. You could be just passing it on to somebody else. I think I think the key word is uh, reverence with this. So so um, I many years ago I helped make a film uh, Earth Pilgrims and we we went to this uh, place in Peru, um, El Sangate. It's this it's this mountain where every year sixty thousand people they all walk up this mountain and they sing and they dance. They spend three days singing and dancing, and they do it to. Uh, give back to the mountain because it's the mountain that sustains them it's the mountain that gives them the water it's the source of all their water um, and so the whole thing is just a giant offering basically a, a 60,000 person yeah, it's incredible 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 thing um, and I, I think we're really lacking that in our culture this this sense of giving back to the to the thing that sustains us and yeah we don't need to it'll sustain us anyway but but, the, but there's a there's a deeper level of connection that when you do give back you, you, it gives back and there's this cycle of giving that just feels very nurturing um, and it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced it but, but, but it's important well you said it'll nurture us anyway but I, I i don't think it will because we can see what's wrong now but as i said earlier on the moment you start regarding the earth in a reverential way then it'll be impossible for us to do the things that we're doing to it now if you see what i mean so therefore it's naturally healing uh, for us and the planet. Um, yeah, so uh, we shouldn't take it for granted that we're constantly being sustained because uh, we're not now, we're at a threshold. We're at a threshold, a very important one. And I, I wasn't sure whether it would happen in my lifetime, the crisis that we're seeing now. And uh, suddenly, yes, it is. Suddenly looking very imminent. It is. It's um, it, it's it's really interesting that all this is happening this year, just before COP twenty six is happening in Glasgow. Is that coincidence? Um, you know, spiritually, you know, we shouldn't really believe in coincidences. So it makes you wonder whether all this intensity is happening for a reason. And um, it, it's a bit like COVID, a bit like COVID. We was all in um, looking at the other end of the spectrum. We were we were all in lockdown last year. Well, the Earth loves a lockdown. <laughs> I felt the earth was Nature. singing. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. No cars. You go outside and you couldn't hum, couldn't hear the hum. No, no planes. Oh, uh, pollution had dropped, and uh, yeah, Earth Earth loves a lockdown. And communities so, thrived. Well, yeah. It was wonderful. People were speaking to their neighbours, yeah. helping them with different shopping and stuff. Yeah. It was wonderful. It was in a, in a way. It was wonderful. Yeah. Another way, it was quite dark. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it was very dark. But from a from a um, 
a landscape healing point of view, earth healing point of view, it was, uh, it was very healing. Yeah, I'm sure Mother Earth probably made a note of that <laughs> somewhere. Ah, this is what happens when everything stops, is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so to get back to this sense of reverence, I mean, you guys, so for example, I went to that King Arthur's Cave with you. I think going to sacred places like that, it's very easy to go there and have a very mundane experience. I've been to Bassemi Tor or Avery or someplace like that, and it's very possible just to go there. And, mm -hmm, okay, cool, we'll go on. Um, that cave I went to, it's quite possible, uh, but I went there with you guys and it was incredible. It was profound. It was deep. It was enchanting. It was, it was, it was healing. It was, I don't, there's so many adverbs I could, uh, mm -hmm. I could throw at it, but it was, it was, um, it was special. So, so for somebody who can't come and join your talks, you know, like we have with COVID now, people can't fly over from all over the world and, um, you know, people can't come and join your, uh, your events. How, how does someone, experience the magic in, in, a, in a magical place? How does someone go there and connect with that, that deeper energy and make, make the experience of going there a magical, sacred experience rather than just a mundane one? Well, I think in our books we give some clues. We just explain how we arrived there at that space. Just, just to go and be humble and be still and be silent and um, just, just, just go as if you're the pupil, you know, and uh, you know, the teachers all around you and uh, the place, the sacred site, what, you know, what do I need to learn here? Because it's very much the mindset of the archaeological scientific mindset when we arrive somewhere. And I see a lot of dowsers doing it. Right, we're going to find out all about this site. We're going to get right in there and we're going to explain it all and all that sort of thing. And uh, I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. And uh, But we have the opposite approach now. We're, we're not the person who's going to crack the site. Uh, we're the person who hopefully will be given some of the place's insights um, and I have found that works nine times out of ten. Yeah, It really so, is. Yeah. You can gain a lot more by doing nothing <laughs> uh, than with the scientific mindset I find. I mean in our books we do all the research, of course we do, we do the history and we do the, the astronomy. The astronomy is always very interesting, it's wonderful, the astronomical alignments, but uh, if you want to really get deep into the earth spirit then just be receptive, mm. just be receptive. Because we are part of the earth as well, you know, so really you're aligning yourself with yourself in a sense. <laughs> you're just, uh, you know, um, attuning yourself to where you should naturally be anyway and where you were back in the hunter-gatherer days, you know. So uh, and we've all been there, we've all had past lives. And sometimes I get a feeling, wow, you know, this is, I felt this before, I just know you know, I, 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 it's like a remembrance rather than new knowledge. It's like a, like a remembrance of something you've done before. Because we never use the word discovery in our books. You'll never see the word, I have discovered this, because how can you discover something that was already known? You know, things are given to us. The insights are given to us. Uh, little clues and we go, oh yeah, I get that now. And uh, I don't like the word discovery. <laughs> it's, uh, things are given to us if we're in the right mindset, I think. Well, you're saying, to, to, so So let's say, you know, Bob, he decides he wants to, instead of going to Disneyland, he wants to go to a cave or to Avery or something like that. Um, you say, go there and be receptive. Is, is that all it takes to kind of invoke and, and perceive the magic and, and, and sacredness of the space? Uh, it, should he chant? Should he dance? I mean, what, what, what's the trick to, to really connect well, and fails. make yeah. it... Sometimes we go to sacred sites and don't chant or drum at all. It just doesn't feel right. So, and you just know. You just, just be guided by his intuition. So it's approaching a site with, with reverence, as we've said, um, appreciating what's there and seeing it with love and giving love and also with gratitude so that you're, you're thankful for what is there. And somehow in that process, what happens is that you just open yourself up to it and you will absorb things and you might be told to sing. You might be told to, to, to drum if you've got a drum with you. Um, you might just be told to sit and meditate. You might be told to go and get an ice cream. <laughs> 
That, so that works for me as it's, well. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a case of listening to, to the messages. Just opening yourself up to it and, and just seeing what it says to you. So it's a bit it's a bit like going in with the attitude of dowsing where you go in and you, you let yourself be moved by yeah. just what it comes up, basically. Yeah. That's the trip. Just be aware of your feelings while you're there. Um, and just be aware of all the different things that are popping into your head. They might be messages. They might be rubbish, but they might be messages. <laughs> Yeah. And use all your senses as well. It's like getting feral, you know, it's like getting back to nature. Mm. You, you know, we're, we're very dependent more humans on our visual thing more than anything else mm. now. But we get people, when we take them to Dartmoor, to touch stones, uh, to sniff stones. What does granite smell like? You know, taste uh, when it, and, and taste it. We get people to taste granite and moss. And it's all about this connecting with the landscape with all your senses rather than just walking, marching across it. We stop at various places and, uh, and and look at things and get people to constantly look at the greater landscape. You know, when we when we some of our regulars now we we'll roll up at a site and I'll say, right, uh, what can we see? And now two or three of them are looking in the distance. <laughs> right, what 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 does Pete want us to notice? You know, and uh, but it's good because you're looking at the whole landscape because there's always a landscape setting to every sacred site, and sometimes that landscape setting is why it's there. And, uh, and then you, drew, you start at that, that level, then you come gradually in, near distance, and then it might be five or ten minutes before, right, now let's touch a stone. And uh, it's... Just feel the earth. Put your fingers into the grass or the moss. Mm. Notice the tiny little flowers that might be there. Or even nettles. Nettles really accumulate round earth energies. Mm. So that might be another thing to, to notice. Or molehills, a lot of moles also seem to follow the energies. So if you see a lot of molehills around, quite often there are earth energies there. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's noticing the whole span of whether it is right in the distance, or the heavens, or actually the earth beneath our feet. I mean, the Native Americans and the Aborigines still have this mindset, you know, just about, and uh, the Inuits and some South American cultures, they, they know, like, they, they're using all their senses and they're like part of the landscape and they're like an animal, you know, going through the jungle. You can see it on some of the programs you watch, you know. They are so in tune with the landscape and um, we try and get that across. You can do that in England, you know, you don't have to go to the Amazon jungle. Um, and you can do it in your own garden. We were giving messages here during lockdown to put Sensing the Earth book together, you know, and uh, that wouldn't have happened without the lockdowns. That book wouldn't have, have happened without the lockdown and us tuning in in the stone circle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I just sat in there. What, what are we meant to do with this time? What good can we make out of this time? And... Uh, yeah, the answer came. So your, your books, you, you cover um, sacred sites and you, you, you cover lots of them, of course, and you've been to many, many sacred sites. Do, do you have a, a favourite sacred site? Is this there one? Oh! oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> so many good ones. I mean, Al Albion Dreamtime, when we, were when we were looking for to create Albion Dreamtime, it was to find the, the sacred sites that were there before man started to build stone circles and stone rows. And ones that were unspoiled. So it was everything that was unspoiled and places that were really special places of power, really spiritual places. So top of the list for me was the White Lady Falls. Mm, beautiful. This is in Lidford Gorge oh, and it's a yeah. really special place. We take people there every night. Oh, yeah, special. daytime or night time is really special, full of nature spirits. You just know you're being watched. So you said that's Very number special. one on the list. That's, that's number in. one on my <laughs> list. That's going in. <laughs> that's going in. <laughs> yeah, mine, oh God, I, 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 I don't know, probably the one that I feel the most connected to is West Kennet Longborough. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was called by that site to do the book on it and uh, it's the only place I think I've ever been to for sure that I know I've been there before in a former life 
and uh, the ashes of my mom and dad are scattered there as well. So that makes it very sacred to me, you know, and it makes me feel how the ancestors felt thousands of years ago when they left their ancestors there. So uh, that has a very special place in my heart. Uh, it really does. And um, yes, <laughs> this is why we still do the, the full moon gatherings there. We're up there on the full moons. Yeah. And on the wider scale, you know, the Earth itself. Um, we were talking about when you go to a, a place to make it to make your experience of going there sacred is you become receptive and you, you tune in and you sort of listen to what the place has to say. Um, what about just you know existing on Earth? So so you know it's very easy to get lost in the humdrum, the mundanity of existing here. Um, and yet sometimes you can transcend that and just regard this place as the most wondrous, mm. magical, you know, garden, Eden environment. Mm. And so well, any, any last sort of tricks to, 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 to live a more uh, reverential life uh, towards this planet? And last words of advice. Mm. To, to appreciate everything, even the bad stuff, because somehow there's a lesson to be learned even in the bad stuff. So every day you go through life with, with love and gratitude for a roof over our heads, for water that comes out the tap, for power, for food, for our clothes, for our, our connections, our family, our friends. It's all just... It's an attitude of gratitude towards, yes, towards everything absolutely. that comes. And, and I think as well, yeah, I think as well, that's, you know, um, some, you know, our, our mother is sick, the great mother is sick, you know, if your real mother was sick, your human mother was sick, you do all you can to nurture her and take care of her and try and heal her. So what's the difference? You know, the Mother Earth is, is our overall mother of humanity. And, um, you know, we, we have a responsibility, I think, to look after her, because we are only here because of her, you know, because Mother Earth, you know, we're, we're all in a physical body. Every atom of this is comes from Mother Earth. So um, she is our mother. Um, and uh, I think we, we owe it to give something back and, and to nurture her because she is ill. She is ill. And um, I, I still hold on to the hope that um, she will be cured. She will get past this phase without um, us having to be a victim <laughs> of that self-curing because at the end of the day she'll do whatever she has to do to create balance again she has no favorites she can't have favorites her, her job description is to create balance so the mother earth doesn't have favorites so she will do whatever she has to do to create balance and um, I, I sincerely hope we have a a part to play in the next part of her magical journey because her magical journey will go on and it's a journey of self-discovery. She too, the earth too, is seeking to know who she is because she hasn't been this way before either. Think about that. And uh, we are part of, the creation of mankind is, is also a part of her seeking, uh, her self-seeking of who she is. So uh, that's how I see, that's how I make sense of all of this and the creation of the universe. The universe is trying to find out what it is and you can only do that by creating and creating and creating until you can create no more and at that point the universe can say oh yeah this is me so um that's my take on the universe folks <laughs> I, I, I share that view with you but um yeah let's uh let, let, let's i also share your hope that we can we can make it through this uh this this challenge there's um, always hope there's always hope there's always hope, there's always hope. Yeah. all right peter sue thank you so much for your time and the energy and all that thank, thank you so much our pleasure thank you